Responding to Albert Einstein's warnings of a likely German nuclear program, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt approved what later became known as the Manhattan Project, a top secret effort to develop an atomic bomb. Army General Leslie Groves wasted no time in recruiting DuPont. Groves knew um, the executives at DuPont and Wilmington, he knew their engineers, and uh, was very impressed with uh, the way they got things done. And DuPont was his first choice when he decided to have a facility for plutonium production. Groves made a personal and persuasive appeal to DuPont President Walter Carpenter. Carpenter went to his executive committee and said that the Army, uh, the country needs our help. And without really knowing what it was that they were signing up for, they gave Groves the okay. As one of DuPont's leading chemical engineers, Crawford soon became involved. Irene DuPont, Greenwald's brother-in-law, first heard of the project at his family's Thanksgiving gathering during the early days of the war. Someone said, well, where's Crawford? And this, you realize, was the fall of 1942, and that my father said something that he certainly shouldn't have, but he didn't know any better. My father said, oh, Crawford is out working on a bomb so terrible that it will end the war. Only a few days after that Thanksgiving, on the 2nd of December, 1942, the Chicago scientists, led by Nobel Prize winning physicist Enrico Fermi, achieved the world's first self-sustained nuclear chain reaction. The reactor, Fermi called it a pile, was a lattice of graphite blocks and uranium tubes built into a squash court beneath the bleachers of Stag Field. Greenwald, who was a member of the DuPont Reviewing Committee charged with investigating the atomic bomb, happened to be at the University of Chicago meeting with Arthur Holly Compton. Compton came to me and said, we're going to try this out. Would you like to see it? I, I love it. <laughs> and so over we went, and I saw the first chain reaction take place. And the thing is, it worked. I, I remember Fermi at the time, uh, when he, he shoved the control rod back into the, the reaction. You know how they told it. It is a question of whether your curve is exponential or whether it's not. And the thing went like that. We all heaved a sigh of relief and said, Hosanna. DuPont was tasked with building the world's first plutonium production plant. Immediately upon learning this, Greenwald confessed in his diary that they all went into the brandy wine room and had a drink of condolence and commiseration. I had my doubts. I, all these people that I met, there were eminent scientists, but none of them were engineers. And uh, the DuPont company was being asked to undertake this major undertaking. And uh, all we had in assurance there was any chance of its working or not were the, the physicists. But Greenwald feared that the Nazis, led by physicist Werner Heisenberg, were two years ahead of the U.S. DuPont's plutonium production operation had to work or the Allies could lose the war. Crawford, among all of the people I've known that ever worked on the project, agreed that in their minds, the Germans were going to drop the bomb any minute. He spent uh, June 6, 1944, listening to the news to see whether the Germans were going to drop the bomb on the invaders at Normandy. Under that ominous cloud, Greenwald helped to guide the Manhattan Project's efforts at Hanford, Washington, where the first of their kind nuclear reactors and processing facilities were to be built. This is where nuclear scientists would create the fuel for America's atomic weapons. It was an enormous undertaking, perhaps the largest in human history to date. In all, as many as 50,000 workers took part in the Hanford Project. You know, the extraordinary thing about it was the speed at which the thing was built. I don't think anything of that sort has ever happened before anywhere. Now, you could only have that sort of thing happening when you have dedicated people. Now, these people were dedicated for two reasons. The first place, their country was at war. And that was a tremendous motivation for them. I know a lot of people that considered this as if they were drafted. Uh, 
They, and so uh, we had no trouble with anybody. Uh, they were all saw the, the demand, and, but they put that extra push into it. And I think that's because they felt a participation in uh, this uh, extraordinary wartime effort. Greenwald's wartime job at Hanford was fast paced, high pressured and packed with frustration. Unreliable train travel across the country was one of many annoyances of the day, but Greenwald responded with a characteristic, imaginative sense of humor. There was always trouble on the trains, and in order to make these little tragedies amusing, he invented an imaginary witch. Her name was Binnaby, a purple witch, and whenever anything went wrong, it was always Binnaby's fault. I mean, Binnaby blew up a bottle of whiskey in his suitcase one time when he was on an airplane. And Binnaby uh, made a hot box on the train. He said, the train was going around a big curve. And I looked out the window and I could see the engine. I knew we were in trouble because guess who was riding on the engine? It was Binnaby. And then of course we'd hear about what Binnaby did. In spite of enormous technical and organizational challenges, in just under one year, the first Hanford reactor, the B reactor, went critical in September 1944. On July 16, 1945, scientists witnessed the world's first atomic explosion in the New Mexico desert. Then on August 9, 1945, the Fat Man atomic bomb, using plutonium produced at Hanford, was detonated over Nagasaki, Japan. The Japanese soon surrendered, and World War II came to a dramatic end. <laughs>